We've been talking about Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, and the calling of God upon our lives. Again, the calling that God has for you and I is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And Paul says that if you are going to walk worthy of that calling, well, then the very attributes and life of Christ should mark your own. Let me just freshly read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, so it's fresh in our mind as we get into this study. Paul says this, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In the last couple of studies, we've been looking at this idea of humility, and I wanted to give one more study just to focus on humility. And you could maybe ask the question, Nathan, why are you spending so much time on humility? And I would genuinely tell you, I think it's because God is consistently putting his finger on that in my life. And as I look at the modern landscape of Christendom, it seems like one of the things that do that does not mark us as believers is humility. So if humility is a primary attribute that, as Peter says, we are to be clothed with humility, well then... I, I just been burdened in my own life saying, okay, God, you've got to deepen and develop this in my life. I, I desperately want to be a man who is marked by the love of Christ and the humility of Christ. And I really desire for that, for you in that as well. What I like to do in this particular study is to look at seven observations on humility. As I was working through this study on humility, I was just kind of looking at what does scripture say about the topic of humility? And this is probably not a complete list, but I kind of summarized all the passages I saw in humility in in the Bible into seven key observations. And I just thought it'd be really helpful for, for all of us as we're talking about humility and what does it mean to walk in the calling with which we've been called, that humility being a defining attribute, well, what does that mean? So I want to give you seven ideas or seven concepts associated with this idea of humility found all throughout scripture. Now, before we jump into these, I'm going to be reading a ton of scripture passages. So one thought is to watch the video version of this and and get all these passages, or I'll try to create some sort of a link where you can download a list of all of this so you could easily reference it later. But let's jump into these seven observations. Number one. There's this idea in scripture that everyone will be humbled, but it is only those who do it willingly who will find grace and salvation. There's this interesting thought in scripture that every single person on planet earth who has ever lived will come to the point of humility. The real question is not if you'll be humbled. The question is when you will be humbled. See, I will either humble myself now and experience his grace, his mercy, and his salvation, or I will be forced to be humbled labor later and my knee will bow and my tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that's not the time to be doing it because then I will find death and destruction and wrath. So let me give you a few verses on this idea. In Romans chapter 14, Paul quotes the Old Testament and says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. Philippians 2, verse 9 and 10 says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him, Jesus, the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Proverbs 29, 23 tells us, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Ezekiel 21, 26 says, exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. There's this interesting idea as we're getting into the Old Testament on these passages that God goes out of his way to help those who are in need. That when you're abased, hey, when, when you find yourself in this humble, lowly position, well, that is when God's grace is available to you. He resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to those who are afflicted and recognize their need for him. So as we continue looking at these passages, realize that if you choose humility now, if you come to God in this attitude of dependence and say, God, I desperately need you. I need your help. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Well, he gives grace for that. We must choose humility now rather than be 
forced to bow later. 2 Samuel twenty two twenty eight continues that idea and says, And you save an afflicted people, but your eyes are on the haughty whom you abase. In other words, he does not put up with the prideful or the haughty in this passage. 2 Corinthians 7, 14, though often used of America and, and culture as a whole, still contains a principle of humility. And it says, God speaking, he says, my people who are called by my name, when they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and I will hear, heal their land. There is a humility that is required for God to hear us, for us to pray and to seek his face, then he will hear us and forgive us and heal the land. It's an interesting thought associated with this idea of humility. Psalm 147, verse 6, it says that the Lord supports the afflicted, the needy, but he brings down the wicked to the ground. Psalm 149, verse 4 says, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. So the ones who are humble, the ones who are in need, he gives salvation to. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 says, though he scoffs at the scoffers, he gives grace to the afflicted or gives grace to to the needy. Isaiah 29 verse 19 says the afflicted also will increase their gladness in the Lord and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah continues in 50, chapter 57 by saying, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. And this is what God says. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and the lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Isn't it interesting that God lives with those who walk humbly and he revives the hearts of those who walk in humility. As James chapter four, verse six says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God opposed is, sorry, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God can only save those who come to him in humility. See, if I'm standing before God in pride, then I will not receive anything from him. His offer of salvation is free. It is available to me. And yet when in my arrogance and pride, I, I close my, my arms, I grip my teeth and I'm like, no, I don't want it. Well, then I will never experience his grace and his mercy and his salvation. It is only when I walk in humility and see my desperate need, the fact that I'm afflicted and needy, that I begin to receive his grace, his mercy, his kindness, his goodness, his salvation. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So one key observation then is that everyone will be humbled. The question really is, when will you be humbled? Will you choose humility now and experience his grace and mercy and kindness and salvation and forgiveness? Or will you walk in pride and arrogance now and later be forced to bend your knee and declare his praises? A second observation is that we are to be seek or that we are to seek to be clothed with humility. As Zephaniah chapter two, verse three says, seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. In Colossians chapter three, verse 12 through 13, it says, so as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So you should seek after and put on humility. Or as we already looked at first Peter five, five, Peter says, you younger men, likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, we looked at this in the last study, but it's that idea of that you you and I are to be clothed with this garment, this slave's clothing that easily identifies you as a Christian. So just as a slave was identified in the Roman Empire by the certain clothing that they wore, so too as a Christian, you and I should be marked and clothed with humility. Therefore, let's seek after it. The third observation is when you humble yourself, strangely, you are exalted. So there's this paradox in scripture that if you want to go up, you must go down. 
If you want to be first, you must be last. If you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 18. He says, whoever then humbles himself as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 23, a couple of chapters later, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. He also says that in Luke 14, 11 and Luke 18, verse 14. Uh, James makes a similar idea. He says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. That's James 4, 10. Or 1 Peter 5, verse 5 and 6. And I keep reading this because it's so profound. But Peter says, likewise, be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. So if I choose humility and I walk in humility, well, there is an exaltation in that. But if I seek to have first place, if I seek to be exalted now, well, then I will be humbled. So there's that weird paradox. So rather than seek to go up, seek the lowest position. Rather than seek to be first, seek to be last. Put everyone in front of you. Another observation, number four, is in humility, God becomes your source and your strength. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 9 and, 9 and 10. Paul is looking at his life and God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. So based on that, here's Paul's response. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, Paul is saying, wow, if I choose humility and I walk in weakness, then God's promise is that I actually receive his strength, that I get his grace and his mercy. So if that's true, if I do get God's grace and his mercy and his strength, when I walk in humility and weakness, why wouldn't we walk in weakness and humility, says Paul. So get this idea. I receive God's strength when I walk in humility. I receive his resource and his ability when I choose to humble myself. Number five is this idea that God defends the humble. In Numbers chapter 12, look at what happens. Moses is being accused by Aaron and Miriam. And they say to Moses, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now, here's the comment that's in Numbers. That the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. <laughs> Could you imagine that being written about you? And you, put your name here, was the most humble person on the planet. Now, that is a daunting statement. But think about the context. Here is Aaron and Miriam, your siblings, saying, are you the only mouthpiece of the Lord? Has not God also spoken through us? And Moses just kind of stands there <laughs> and just takes it. But the Lord heard it. And then a couple of verses later, listen to what it says. God speaks and God says, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So get this idea. Aaron and Miriam come and speak against Moses saying, are you the only person who can speak for the Lord? And God says, yes. <laughs> In other words, yes, I'll use prophets, but Moses is special. I love this idea that because Moses was the most humble person on the planet, God stood up and defended Moses. That Moses didn't have to defend his reputation. Moses didn't have to defend his position with God. Rather, God defended Moses. You see, that, you see that same idea in Luke chapter 10 with Mary and Martha. Jesus and the disciples have come into Bethany and, and Martha is busy in the kitchen and Mary finds herself at the feet of Jesus. So listen to what this says. Uh, this is Luke 10 verse 40 through 42. But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations and she came up to Jesus and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell my, then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So here's Mary and she's sitting at the feet of Jesus and she doesn't stand up. She doesn't defend herself. She didn't say, Martha, dear sister, hey, I'm in the proper position. Rather, she stays in a humble position and Jesus rises up and defends her. Wouldn't it be neat if in the midst of us walking in humility that we just allow the Lord to be our defense? Over and over throughout the Psalms, we're told that the, the Lord is our defense. He's our strong tower, that he's our rock. He's our refuge. See, what if we actually believe that? And rather than trying to defend our reputation or defend our position, we just said, Lord, I trust you. And if they don't understand, so be it. But Lord, I'm putting my faith and my hope on you. And I'm choosing to walk in humility. So Lord, if I need to be defended, you are going to have to bring the defense. I love that idea. A sixth observation is that the humble are not persuaded or concerned by public opinion. See, isn't it interesting that if you actually walk in humility, you actually don't care what you think about or what what people think about you. See, when I have a fear of man or I'm concerned about the public opinion or uh, what what are they going to think about me? That's actually pride operating within my life. And this has been so big in my life. God is constantly putting his finger on this one of saying, Nathan, why? Why do you care so much about the approval and the acceptance and the affirmation of the people around you? Would you not just seek my approval, acceptance, and affirmation? And that is such a hard thing in our culture when we are so inclined for the likes and the thumbs up and text messages and social media. When we want to say the thing that just gets that head nod and yes, I I agree with you. See, what would happen though If I walked in humility and said, Lord, I actually do not care about public opinion, that even if everyone stands against me, so be it. If I'm walking faithfully according to the word of the Lord. So if I walk in humility, there is a reality that begins to take place in my life where I'm not persuaded or concerned about the approval and the acceptance and the affirmation of those around me. Listen to what 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, and then verse 22 says. David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Now, if you remember the story, his wife comes and accuses him saying, um, you were dancing rather, rather promiscuously. And in other words, David had stripped down basically to his boxer shorts and was dancing before the, the, the ark of the Lord as it was coming into Jerusalem. And listen to what David's response is. He is walking in humility. He does not care about the approval and the affirmation uh, of his wife in this scenario, nor what the people around him even think in Jerusalem. And David's response is, I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. What he's really saying, and let me give you another translation. He says, I will be even more undignified than this and I will be humble in my own sight. What he's basically saying, which is a rather awkward thought process, here's here's David, he strips down basically to his boxer shorts, he's dancing before the ark of the Lord, and his wife looks out the window and says, uh, you're a king, and that's not how a king behaves. And he looks at his wife and says, hey, in the presence of my Lord, in the celebration and the rejoicing of his presence coming into the holy city, if it is necessary, I will become even more undignified than that. <laughs> which there's only one way to become more undignified, which is not to wear anything at all. <laughs> and I'm really glad we're not mimicking David in our worship services. But the reality is, do you, do you realize he did not care about the public approval? He did not care what people around him thought because he's walking in humility with the Lord. And here's a seventh observation. Humility is relational. And I can't find a time in scripture where it's just an impersonal thing where it's just about me in and of myself. In other words, yes, when I'm alone, I'm called to walk in humility. And yet the reality is, is so oftentimes humility is associated with this idea of community. Now it makes sense in light of scripture because they had a communal mindset. It was, it was, we we're very individualistic in our Western society where they were a, a group. It was all about the family structure. 
So when we're talking about humility, it's not just me and myself in my own little life by my, you know, in, in my closet. In reality, humility is to be lived and demonstrated and applied in community and relationships, which is hard. It's so difficult. And that's where it is proven. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter two, verse three and four. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. And by the way, the word nothing in Greek actually means nothing. So nothing in my life should be done through selfishness or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, I am to regard one another as more important than myself. Do not look merely, or sorry, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. See, what would happen if we, especially in the church, lived out that passage that I wasn't seeking my own prestige or my own applause or my own whatever. I wasn't even seeking for my own personal interests. I was actually saying, hey, how can I serve? How can I wash your feet? How can I pour my life out for you? Hey, how, how can I meet your needs today? Could you imagine what it would look like for a church on a Sunday morning to gather together? And it wasn't about my preferences or my music style or my what I get out of the service. But I came with the heart of saying, how can I serve the people around me? Hey, how can I meet your needs? Could you imagine what it would look like for a visitor to come into the middle of that? If a visitor came into a church, a body of believers who were all seeking not their own interests, but the interests of each other and washing each other's feet and, and serving the needs, that, that, would, that would so grip the unbelieving world that they would say, I, I need to become a Christian. See, you and I are not called to be selfish and self-focused. Rather, we are to walk in humility in the midst of community. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says, Remind them, Paul is speaking to Titus, saying, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, and showing every consideration for all men. See, what would it look like if we had that attitude and we stooped and we washed the feet of those around us? I want to finish with another quote by Andrew uh, Andrew Murray. Again, if you've never read the book Humility by Andrew Murray, it is such a powerful declaration of what does humility look like in our lives. And I love what he says, especially in this idea of relationships with humility. Andrew Murray says this, it is in our relationships with one another in our treatment of each other, that true lowliness of mind and a heart of humility are seen. Our humility before God has no value except as it prepares us to reveal the humility of Jesus to our fellow man. Do you have that? Could I encourage you afresh to clothe yourself with humility? Oswald Chambers said in his prayer, God bathe us in humility. And we just walked through seven simple observations, but the reality is, is that the entirety of God's word is constantly declaring one thing, that God is God and you are not. And therefore we must walk in humility. We, we must strive to go low and get our face in the ground to see ourselves as lowly because it is only when we walk in humility that we experience the, the grace and the grandeur of God in our life. See, God cannot change things in our life. God is not going to sanctify our lives. We're never going to experience the fullness of salvation in a day-by-day -day process if we think we're actually sufficient in and of ourselves. You and I are called to walk in humility. So with that being kind of the forefront, let's just pray and just freshly surrender our lives before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So join me in prayer. Lord, uh, you, you are so high and lifted up. And Lord, I pray that you, even this day, would give us a fresh focus and vision of what it means to walk in humility, that, that it's not a facade. It's not just a fake it till you make it. It's that in light of you, like Isaiah, we are so overwhelmed that, that our only response by your holiness is, woe is me. I am undone. And Lord, could you so change and cleanse and transform our life? Your promise is that you give grace to the humble, but you oppose the proud. So, Lord, I pray that you would not allow us to walk in arrogance or pride or selfishness. But, Lord, in your kindness, would you, would you put your finger on anything in our life that just smells of, of self, that smells of pride? And, Lord, could we somehow, through your grace and through your enablement and through your power, walk in humility? Can we be clothed with humility and somehow be marked by your life in this generation. 
Lord, may our lives give you all the praise and all the glory that you are that you are worthy of. We love you, Jesus. Just give you all the praise and the glory in your precious name. Amen.